All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Wax Days Vienna. Uh, I hope you're doing good. You had a coffee and uh, ready for some Docker stuff. Um, to be honest, I have to tell you, this is my very first conference talk ever. I'm very nervous and I will try to get distracted by the content. Talk is called Docker Basics. I will try to cover um, the real basics. Uh, what is Docker? How does it work? What are the uh, elements of a Docker ecosystem? Uh, we will um, uh, see um, how it really works uh, by running examples. I'll try to um, do it all live. And at the end, I will try if the inter internet connection works uh, to also do something online. Um, I'm very sure everybody of you already heard about Docker. Who did not hear about Docker yet? And um, when talking about Docker, it um, is often mentioned uh, together with uh, microservices and microservice architectures. Who, uh, who is uh, familiar or has some experiences uh, with microservices already? Okay, using Docker. Okay, um, so I will try to, on the one hand, uh, explain how, how this whole Docker stuff works, and on the other hand, always uh, give a bit of a, uh, advice or, or um, um, relation to, to the microservice world. And this is also why I put these goals on the first uh, slide. So uh, the goals. Uh, of this whole uh, technology and also uh, what I'm trying to explain is um, uh, we want to, uh, instead of build software that uh, someone can install somewhere, uh, we want to ship runnable services. So someone can take this piece and just run it with no installation, uh, preconditions, whatever. That is basically uh, what we can achieve with Docker. Services shall be immutable. That's the, all, the whole Docker story. Uh, we will see uh, how this is um, um, realized. So instead of upgrading a software or patching a software, we just uh, shut down and destroy the old uh, instance and uh, start the new instance. So not modifying anything, just uh, releasing a new version of the whole runnable service. Um, yeah, we will see how we manage the various life cycles of a, of a Docker instance, of a service. Um, of course, uh, as Docker is available on the um, prominent platforms, uh, you can run the service everywhere. So just uh, as a um, Java program, build one, run anywhere, uh, you can do this with the whole application. And also, if we have time, we will see uh, how to manage the manage all applications um, with some Docker tools. All right, when talking about uh, microservice applications, um, something like this uh, could show up uh, if you're familiar with, uh, for example, um, uh, the Netflix stack, Spring Cloud, uh, this will be very familiar uh, with you. Uh, basically, what uh, microservice architecture or service oriented architecture is is um, to split the application into components and those components are not software modules like libraries or so but they are real running um, programs um, and they specify an interface how to interact with them and uh, this is called the service and um, the, mi the word microservice um, uh, shall shall um, shall um, note that uh, we want to create tiny services that really um, focus on one thing at a time, and uh, rather have more of them than uh, just a few big ones. So, um, as I said, a uh, microservice uh, um, has a specific purpose. I uh, tried to come up with some ideas for, for example, a customer service, contract service, 3D print service, as one could imagine. We have an online website where you can order 3D prints and we have specific 
uh, parts of the application and each service just handles a single part. And the services um, 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 between them, they interact uh, over network communication via interfaces and therefore they are abstracting away the implementation. So they manage their domain, their, their data. I won't uh, go into more details about microservices now, just to give you an idea. They are ideally stateless and parallelizable. Why is this important and interesting and how does this relate to Docker? So Docker containers um, can be started very easily, very quickly. And uh, there are some tools where you can easily scale out. So horizontally scale, so start N instances of a service. And if it's stateless and parallelizable, it's uh, very easy to scale. You can use just uh, Docker tools without having something in your software for it. Yeah, they have a clear interface and a contract, and this allows any other service to talk to the service and uh, not depend on their implementation, which leads to the last point. Uh, they can be technology agnostic, so each service can be implemented in their own um, technology. And uh, when talking about technologies, as uh, you might have no, uh, heard, Docker encapsulate everything that is needed to run a, a service. So all the dependencies, the technologies, the libraries, the configuration, and so on. Uh, therefore, from the outside, there is just this network interface and uh, how to talk to the service. And from the outside, you uh, do not need to know what uh, technology is used inside. And as we don't ship software that uh, needs to be installed, but rather software that um, uh, can be run, everything is included. All right, so much for the um, background. Now uh, coming to Docker, what is it all about? Uh, first, before um, uh, jumping into starting a container, I want to explain a few elements that uh, seem important to me to understand. The main uh, part of the Docker is the Docker engine. And from the documentation, it says, Docker engine builds images and runs your containers. A Docker image uh, is a blueprint of a service. It uh, tells the Docker ecosystem how to launch an instance. And an instance is called the Docker container. So a runnable, um, runnable instance is called container. If you have two instances, then you have two containers. And an image is the blueprint, which uh, uh, is the basis where you start instances from. Um, and then there is the Docker command line client. And we will see the basic uh, usage uh, later on. To explain it uh, in an image, here you see um, what I mean, there is a Docker engine. This is a, a daemon running on your system. And this daemon cares for uh, running the containers, caring about the lifecycle, storing the images, building images, and so on. We will see how this works. And then there is the Docker command line program. The Docker command line program is really a REST client, which just over the network talks to this Docker engine. And as you can see here, if you could have multiple Docker engines on multiple hosts and all, always use this command line client program. In other words, if there is no Docker engine running, this command line program does nothing. You cannot build images with this command line program or run containers or whatnot. It just um, remote control this Docker engine. And also interestingly, uh, the images uh, are stored within the Docker engine context. So in order to share the images um, uh, to other Docker engines, um, you would need uh, either to build them uh, on the Docker engine or uh, use a Docker registry uh, to push the images um, onto, and, and then you can pull it from there. A Docker registry is, there. there is an official Docker registry. Also, you can use something called Nexus or Artifactory. Uh, typical artifact management of which you probably already use um, for uh, a Maven ar artifact, right? <laughs> All right, let's see how this uh, works.
right. The first thing I want to do is just run an image, uh, yeah, run a container. Can you read the? Yes. So in order to to um, run a, a, a service or a container, uh, start the container, you would need a running Docker engine, which uh, um, nearly sits in the in the menu bar on on OS X. You can download, install it, and then uh, it's run. And then you can use the command line client program Docker to talk to it, and uh, use the command run um, dash D, which tells us to detach in the background, and then uh, the name of the image you want to start the container from. And you will see this is pretty quick. Um, this is all, and we have a running container. Uh, each container is identified by a unique container ID, and this container ID can be used to talk to, uh, to modify the container state, start, stop, uh, and so on. There's a, a a command called ps and with ps you can uh see <coughs> you can see um uh all the running containers you see the container id uh this is like git uh where you only see the first few uh bytes uh which are necessary to identify the container and you can see we uh just started our container um and uh, per default, uh, Docker uh, assigns a random name to our container, uh, which can also be used to interact with this container. Uh, you can also see us Nginx, I think everybody knows Nginx, a web server, um, exposes two ports, port 80 and port 443. And as you can imagine, Docker um, is a virtualization technology which uh, uh, allows um, uh, for each instance to um, have their own IP address and their own port range. And in order to talk to them, we need to port forward the ports to our local machines, like uh, as we do with VMware VirtualBox and so on, or with a NAT router. So uh, in order to do that, we need to start the, uh, the container with a port forwarding, and we can do this with a minus, minus P uh, and use, for example, port 82 and forward it to port 80 in this container. We do this, we get a new container ID and we, we see this running container here has a port forwarding for, from our local machine, port 82 to port 80. When we uh, point our browser to this um, port 82, we see our, our running Nginx. So as you can see, it's very quickly to start the container. Uh, you can run any number of containers on your machine. As they are very lightweight, they use up uh, only very uh, few resources. Uh, this is a, a kernel virtualization uh, technology, which uh, does not need a full-blown virtual machine or, or, or such. It's just a, a isolated process in your in your operating system. All right, and then for the last sample here, um, it's good to name your container um, with your own uh, name, then you won't get assigned a random name by Docker and you can identify your containers later on. So in that case, of course, 82 is already taken. And of course, we have this name already. Oh, okay, I started it early on, that too. And here we say we see the name, and we can say, okay, Docker stop web two. All right, I think uh, that's all for for now. Okay, we started the container based on an image, and uh, now I want to explain what this image is all about, and uh, and then uh, we'll show you how to uh, build images uh, by your by yourself. So a Docker image uh, is basically a 
description how to um, how to create and run a container. It's a boot start script and description uh, of how to how to run a container. This script is uh, composed of lines, and each line has a comment. And uh, what Docker does when building an image, it executes these lines. And with each line, after each line, it saves the state in a so-called image layer. And then it mounts this layer, it executes the next line and saves saves the state uh, again and create a new layer. This uh, way, uh, first of all, it's uh, very um, um, lightweight in um, uh, consumption of, of, of um, uh, storage and you can reuse the layers. So if you uh, build an image, uh, say for example, you start with Nginx and then uh, you put up some websites in it and then you put some configuration in it and then you build a similar uh, image uh, that also uses Nginx and uh, some configuration you used before, images can be reused. So it's very uh, nice to, to handle this uh, storage and you can reuse it. And, uh, and also very important, those images are immutable. So you can never change an image. You can o only build upon it and then build a new image. This way, those can be shared uh, across multiple images and um, uh, yeah, services. Uh, there is a base image. So uh, typically you will start from a base like a, a file system, like for example, um, a base image, which already gives you a Java virtual machine or a web server or something, and then build on top of it. Uh, image are identified by a name and a tag. A tag is basically the version number, or you can use it as a version number. It's alphanumeric uh, string, so you can, you, so you can uh, uh, put anything in there. Images are layered, Im layers are re re reused, and to build an image you use this docker file, which is this script This describes how to build this image. And of course there's a Maven plugin, how to uh, create a uh, docker image uh, from your Java application. And as I said before, uh, there is a, do you see the cursor? No. There's a caveat, uh, of course, the Docker engine needs to be run. So just uh, building the, the image with your command line client won't work. You need a running Docker engine. Why is this important? Because typically in your um, development lifecycle, you would not build your image by yourself or by hand, but this would be rather doing your continuous integration server. And in order to uh, for it to build an image, it needs a Docker engine uh, running to do the job and then push it to a Docker registry. All right, let's see how this works. Here we have a Docker file. And this Docker file, uh, as I said, uh, every line is executed and an image is created. Um, we start with a base image with the command uh, from and then the image name and the image tag. Alpine is very uh, famous minimal Linux distribution, which is like four megabytes. And uh, if you are not sure where to start, you should start or you could start from Alpine and uh, uh, start from there. Uh, the idea when building an image is to only include the things you would need for this service. As we saw before the microservice architecture, we have multiple microservices and every microservice, as the name suggests, should be tiny and uh, therefore just include what you need. Start with nothing and just add what you need. Then some meta information. And then there is a, a just one um, last command. It's called entry point. Um, every image ca has only or can only have one entry point, which is not true. So if you have an image which has an entry point and build another layer on top of it, which is an entry point, the first one is ignored and just the last one is uh, used. And what is an entry point? Entry point is the command that is 
being run when running the container. Um, yeah, and there are several notations how to declare an entry point. Here, there's a JSON array with strings uh, with the command uh, to to invoke and in the and the parameters. In order, so th this is everything you would need to to build an image, and this image would uh, just put out hello world. And now I will try to build this image uh, um, from this Docker file. Uh, we uh, use Docker build minus t, t is for for tagging the image uh, with a name, and we call it hello world. And colon. Um, and then the tag, and we use just uh, one as a version number. And then we need uh, to um, to uh, put a path here, and this is the path to the Docker file. And what happens now is very interesting. As a, remember, I said uh, Docker engine builds the, the the image, and the Docker engine could uh, be located on a remote machine. So what happens now? Uh, you can see in the first um, line. It's sending the so-called build context to the Docker daemon. And what this means, it, it uh, takes this directory, which is the local directory, plus everything in it, all subdirectories, all files, and so on, and um, sends it over the wire to the Docker engine, and then tells the Docker engine, OK, there is a Docker file in the ro ro root directory. Use this and build your image. And this is what it does. Uh, it starts with a. Uh, uh, the base image um, creates an intermediate image with an image ID, use the met meta information, uh, creates a, an image again. Uh, here it says using cache because I did this uh, already, so it does not does not do any work. And then um, it uh, uh, puts this entry point there and creates a new image and successfully built this image with Docker images. We can see we have this Hello World image here. And when we run it, um, then we should see Hello World. All right. So in order to build this image, use a Docker file. Build, uh, build it with, uh, with Docker build, and then uh, you can start containers from it. Let's try another example. Um, we have another uh, Docker file here. Uh, we start from an Nginx uh, um, image we used before to start the Nginx web server. And we replace the index HTML in the, in the Nginx uh, uh, configuration and uh, see what, what this does. Again, we're building this image, we're sending the context, it creates the image, and successfully builds the image. We have um, a Voxed web here, and we can just run it, detached, because it's a, a server, uh, we give it a name. Uh, we uh, forward ports. I will come to this in a second and uh, um, tell it which image to use. It starts this uh, this uh, container. You see it here, voxed web. And I did a minus big P instead of just forwarding a, uh, a single port uh, with a big P. It tells, take all the exposed ports the service declares and uh, assign a random port on the local machine. Why is this useful? Because if you start like three instances of this container, uh, you would need, need three different ports uh, to, to use with the service. And this is how it... Uh, does it, and here you can see the port uh, 32773 is used uh, to forward to port 80. And when we point the browser to this, uh, we uh, see uh, the service running in a container with just 
started from the image we created. So this is to show you, you can use an existing image, which is a service, a web service, um, something, and modify it by uh, layering your modification on top of it. You won't uh, uh, modify the original image. It's immutable, so nothing, uh, nothing will happen. Why is this useful? For, for example, you could uh, create a software which needs uh, some configuration and there is a different configuration for different environments and you could uh, put the configuration file as a last uh, image layer on top of it and have uh, different flavors of your image with different configuration files for different environments. Uh, and you're sure that the software is not, uh, so that the service is not modified because it's a base image from, from there. As you can imagine, you can build a, a lot of Docker files, each building upon each other. All right. Okay. Next. All right. One uh, very interesting thing is, uh, I told you before, there's the Docker engine uh, daemon, and this Docker engine uh, daemon needs to be run in order to start containers, create um, images, and um, yeah, and this can be located on a remote machine. Um, there is a tool coming with Docker. It's called Docker Machine, and with this uh, Docker Machine tool, you can manage Docker engines. Uh, you can uh, create Docker engines, uh, you can create Docker engines in the cloud, and uh, you can then use the Docker engines to, to run your services. Um, this is uh, a pretty useful tool, it's pretty neat, and uh, this is uh, probably the tool you would uh, uh, use in your automated environments to start Docker engines, uh, build images, start containers, uh, do some integration testing, um, then shut everything down, delete the Docker engine again, uh, free up the resources, and uh, uh, of course uh, you only uh, 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 yeah pay for the resources you would uh, you would use. I will try to show that to you. All right. We are using DigitalOcean uh, in my company, so that's why I'm using DigitalOcean. And what I do is I use Docker Machine create uh, to create a new DigitalOcean cloud instance, install Docker Engine on it, and connect it to the local machine in order to use it. I already started it because it takes a while. Uh, Docker Machine is a program which allows you to do that. And how it's uh, done, it's uh, um, done with a plugin system and you uh, need to specify a driver, uh, what to use, uh, basically what remote technology you're connecting to. In this case, I'm using dash dash driver digital ocean and of course as you can imagine you need to supply the the access token to it and then the last parameter is the name of the of the machine uh, which you're creating and what it does it connects to the cloud to digital ocean um, creates a new uh, cloud instance installs docker engine and um, lists it in the local inventory of course, there are a lot of other parameters which you can uh, fine grain control the creation of a cloud instance. So, what flavor it is, um, and how to assign a, a elastic IP address, and so on. The drivers are available for all the major cloud providers, so Amazon, Google, Microsoft, uh, DigitalOcean. It's also available for OpenStack. So, if you're running your own cloud infrastructure. Um, um, in your company, you can um, 
uh, control it with, with Docker machine as well. And also there is a, a driver called VirtualBox and with uh, dash dash driver VirtualBox you can create a new Docker engine using VirtualBox on your machine in order to test everything uh, your continuous integration environment would do, for example. Uh, what this also does, which is pretty nice, uh, in order to connect to the uh, to the remote machine, it uses SSH and it uh, also takes care uh, automatically takes care about uh, key generation, key registration. So every remote machine um, is uh, uh, using their own uh, SSH key, and this is all managed uh, by Docker machine. And hopefully, it will complete in a few seconds, and then we can use it. <coughs> In parallel I can uh, already show you uh, a few other commands. Docker machine um, ls lists uh, the Docker machines uh, which are registered and you can have, as you can imagine, a lot of different machines locally, remotely and so on, all identified with the name. Oops. Here we can already see our DigitalOcean instance, and which is still installing Docker. Hopefully, very quickly, I can in parallel. I can show you how to create a uh, virtual machine with virtual box or, or um, Docker engine on virtual box and vbox1 should be probably a bit quicker hmm so I must wonder if anybody has any questions well, yes of course thanks for uh, uh, the hint do you have any questions so far i know this is pretty quick um try to cover a few topics yes Yes. So the question was, uh, the idea of Docker containers, are they run in an isolated environment? And um, is it, the question is, is it possible to share resources between those containers? So of, yes, of course. Um, first of all, uh, the idea bit behind the whole microservice uh, uh, topic is not to share physical resources, but rather talk about uh, network uh, interface, network communication, use, for example, uh, a caching service or whatnot to store information. Uh, but of course, uh, at some point, you would need a data storage or persistent storage, and you would need a local file system. You can mount uh, the, f the file system of the of the hosting operating system, like my machine, into a Docker container, and this Docker container inside the process can write to this file system. Of course, you can uh, mount it to to several machines. This is how it works. Um, yeah. Was there another question? No. Somehow, screen went blank. Okay. Is the projector still working? No? I think not. <laughs> hmm. All right. I think I don't know how to handle this. Is anybody here who can help me? No. Well, um, then I have a couple of minutes left. Um, I will just uh, explain to you what uh, you can do with Docker Machine. I'm sorry, uh, we have no uh, picture anymore. So we created the Docker uh, uh, Machine entry uh, with on DigitalOcean, and it installed the Docker engine. It creates the uh, SSH keys, registers it, and then you can um, 
basically configure your Docker client program to point instead of the local Docker engine to the Docker engine on DigitalOcean. And then a really neat thing uh, about this Docker, uh, how this Docker implementation is done is to use exactly 100% the same commands you used before with Docker run Nginx, Docker build the image, and as it points to the remote Docker engine in the cloud, it does nothing uh, uh, different than locally. It uh, sends, the, for example, the build uh, context over to DigitalOcean and says, okay, build me an image and store it locally. And then with Docker run Nginx, for example, it starts the Nginx on the cloud machine. So um, you write your, uh, basically your Docker scripts and then uh, you can uh, choose by uh, at runtime which Docker engine to use. So this is very useful for your continuous integration environment, local testing, and also, of course, then the different uh, production system staging, production, and so on. Um, what is interesting uh, is that, uh, of course, um, um, if, if there is an image, you want to run a container from an image that, is, uh, that you don't have. For example, when you first start to try to start the Nginx container and there is no Nginx image on your machine, it uh, works similar to Maven. It goes to the central repository, downloads the image, and then stores it locally in your Docker engine and starts. Only uh, you need to remember that the images are local to the Docker engine, so if you create a Docker engine in the cloud, want to start your image, you first need to somehow put the image there, either build it there or use a Docker registry to share it. Um, what I cannot show you um, now, there is a Maven plugin or there are several Ma Maven plugins for building Docker images out of a Java application. Uh, I'm using uh, the Maven plugin from Spotify. Just uh, uh, go to Maven repository and uh, Google for or search for uh, Spotify Docker plugin. Uh, it uh, perfectly um, uh, works together when you, when you build a char um, or executable uh, application and then it uses it, it as an entry point, builds a Docker um, image, and then you can start up and ship your Java application uh, as a Docker image, which runs everywhere without needing to install Java and so on and so on. All right, I think I will close with it. Uh, any more questions? Or if you have uh, more questions later, you can uh, look me up uh, at the coffee. Thank you.